Alrighty. Um, thanks for watching. And not going to be very long. Um, so, going to, yeah, not going to be very long at all. Um, so, I want to talk about one thing. Uh, and eventually, I'm going to have a podcast on this subject. Um, but what I want to talk about, one little thing, um, for those that are, you know, that are fairly new, I call the channel Mark's Music Place, but, and people know that I'm, I'm sporadically posting videos, but I felt compelled, uh, I really felt compelled to make this video because I was watching quite a videos on this subject. I was watching videos on, um, economics, what's going on with the economy, uh, and so forth. And if you don't think that's important, just think about your financial situation and what it is that you can and most of it, and think about most of what you can't afford. Now, now you weigh your needs to your wants um, and then weigh your financial a situation and then weigh what it is what is it that I can't afford versus what it is what is it that I can't afford and then weigh in what I can't afford ver and ba base that against wants versus needs for example I can't afford a Jaguar but the point is now you have to weigh in the point do I need a Jaguar versus do I just want a Jaguar and that goes within the the philosophy of everything, because um, the reason why I'm making this video is because it's you know what America's number one kryptonite. You know what kryptonite to people in the United States. You know what you know what our kryptonite, our number one kryptonite is debt. And we're all programmed to fall into it. Debt is like a black hole. Um, if you're into science, you've heard of black holes. Debt is basically a big black hole. Um, the difference is in space, most of the time when something falls into black hole, it can't come out. When it comes to debt, you can actually get out of debt. But the number one thing to fix debt is how bad you want to fix what you can't afford against what you can't afford. Most of us want to be able to afford everything that we want as and on top of everything that we need. Not only do we want to be able to afford everything we want, we want to be able to afford everything we... Uh, not only can, do we want to be able to afford to pay everything we need, but we also want to definitely want to be able to afford things that we want. Because when we can pay everything that we need, meaning we need a place to stay, we need food, we need uh, basic necessities, we need water, we need uh, supplements, you know, you need hygiene things, stuff like that. And on top of that, what makes life so great for a lot of people compared to other people is their ability to be a, not only they can pay all their needs they can pay all their wants or practically close to it and but the traps here's the traps and i'll tell you what traps are most of the traps are sales um loans credit cards even student loans. Anything that says loan, I don't care if it's a student loan, unsecured loan, secured loan, 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 loan. It is a debt. There's this saying that says people become slave to the lender. In other words, if people loan you money, you become slave to that. You become obligated to that. So even if you get credit card, that's a, just another form of a loan is a credit card. <clears throat> So imagine, it's kind of like, think about, think about it like this. You don't think about any other way when it comes to 
long. See, people, there are so many people that figure, and it's, it, I find this funny, and you hear this with whether it's some person, I don't care, male or female, whatever, they, they think simply because of their income that they're making gross or net that if they have enough money to make payments on things, then they're, they are, I'm good because I got enough money to pay, make payments. So I'm, I ain't worried about it. I can afford my payments, right? You don't have to worry about my stuff being repoed or repossessed or whatever, right? The problem is that nothing's promised tomorrow. Not even the government. Um, so um, to, to basically to sum up what I'm trying to say in this video is that credit cards and loans and anything that you have to use to make a small portion, I think the best analogy with, let's say this bag of M&Ms, right? Let's say this bag of M&Ms is $4.99. Five ninety nine or whatever. Let's say whatever it was. Here's in, in in our minds on the very very small level, you know, versus we call it the micro level, you know, the very very small level, right? In your mind, four ninety nine. I can pay four ninety nine. I can pay five dollars for that. Because let's say you have five dollars, right? Four ninety nine plus the tax, so five dollars and fifty cent or whatever. I got five dollars fifty cent. I can pay that. Now you bought this item of M&M's debt free, right? Because you paid the entire purchase. You didn't have to finance a bag of M&M's. You paid cash for it straight out, right? The number one thing is we don't look at it like that because we look at it like, well, it's just a, that's a very small thing. I make, you know, I'm going to say I'm making $3,000 a month. I can afford to pay $5 on a bag of M&M's, right? But when we start going to bigger scale things, like the bigger stuff, like cars and things like that, well, most people, even I'll say, let's say there's a car that's $3,000, so obviously if it's $3,000, it's in probably nine times 10, it's an older car. It might have a few, it could have major problems or it could have a few minors, or it might not have no problems. It depends on the situation of the car and so forth. But here's the, here's the deal. Most people can afford to not finance a bag of m and but even if they're making $3,000 a month, they can't afford to finance or they can't afford to, to slap $3,000 in cash for a $3,000 car, even though they make $3,000 a month. You know what most people have to do? They have to at least finance that $3,000 car for at least a, maybe a year, 12 months, right? So that would break down the car to maybe $240 a month or whatever. And the reason being, because we need we 3000 you minus all the taxes. Now we're probably only really realistic going to make it $2,500 a month. <clears throat> and then on top of that, you you know, your living situation, you know, you, maybe your, your rent or whatever is at $800 to $1,000 a month. Lights and water and gas is another three or $400, you know, car and, you know, whatever, you know, food, gas. So that leaves you another three or $400, your cable, your phone bill. That's another three four hundred dollars. Before you know it, you're down only down to about three or four hundred dollars after you pay everything. So that leaves you room to make your car payment of two hundred and forty dollars for a year on a three thousand dollar car. Right? Now, uh, here's the situation. If you think about this for a second, on a three thousand dollar car, let's say 
if you was three thousand dollars a month and let's say you were paying after you paid everything you had a couple hundred dollars left over you know what most people do with that couple hundred dollars it's either off to uh they that's the waste that's the waste money that's the the two the the liquor money this is stuff that you will never see in other words you can never get a return on an investment on liquor because people consume it and once you consume anything it becomes waste your body wastes that stuff out so that's that's a waste um what else people do uh when it comes to that extra money um and there're going to be women that watch this they're watching this channel going to get mad but getting your hair done with expensive hairdos that you're only going to have for about a week or that's about it most of the time you only three or four days getting your hair and nails done on a woman or um or whatever the case some people figure no that's just improving myself but there's and I'm not saying not to improve your appearance what I'm trying to say is that you have to look at what you're wasting meaning what do most people do well I'm not going to cook or I'm just going to go out and eat at Burger King or McDonald's or Red Lobster or, or eating out period if you tally up and let's say you use your debit card and you look at how much just calculate if you, if you look at your monthly bill, your monthly, your monthly bank statement of what you spent on all the restaurants that you went to in a week for the, or for the entire month, just to add up every single purchase and you'll be amazed that it, it something going eating out at restaurants every day, two or three times a day. Um, Look, add that how much that will be in the entire month versus the same amount of money, money, same amount of money that you wasted eating out could have been the money used to buy groceries and you cook. And most of the time, the money that's used to, for groceries to cook when you buy groceries will always be significant, significantly less than eating out almost every day yet some people will yeah, even though the cost of groceries have gone up significantly but it will not it will never surpass the amount of just eating out the amount and on top of that i'm not just talking about just i'm not even talking about just the amount of money that we waste eating out but all the other stuff that we buy just random just random uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Random spur um, of the moment buys, you know, impulse buys is what they're calling. Just impulse buys. Oh, there's a magazine. It may have an ad on it, you know, whatever, or maybe a particular article or something. Most of the magazine doesn't have anything we're interested in reading, but it may have one article, so we waste three or four dollars on that. Or, you know, whatever, some certain type of classified or whatever. Or some people will waste money on, um, if you really want to get into the, a wasteful habit is people that smoke, even though it's an addictive habit or vapors or smokers, right? Even though they, you know, if you look at the amount of cigarettes that a person smokes, that once they smoke that it becomes a cigarette, but how much they've lost buying packs of cigarettes that you can't replenish in any type of return on investment smoking cigarettes cigarette butts they they become puppers they become 100% useless after a person smokes a cigarette it's the butt is you know so pack of cigarettes 15 20 dollars whatever look how much money if you waste on a pack of cigarettes weekly you know that's cigarettes 20 dollars you, you know, one pack, you smoke one pack a week times four pack, that's 
If you do $80 a month, let's see how much a pack of cigarettes are over $80 a month. I'm going to um, use my calculator here, 80 times 12. That's $960, which is close to $1,000, right? Just in cigarettes that a person smokes that, you know, if it, let's say other useless things that we, you know, so the impulse buys, you know, soda pop, sodas, right? Sodas and chips and snacks that we, that we monthly ice cream or whatever that, you know, yeah, I get it. Snacking is a snack is a habit at the, but at the same time, well, any food that you consume is not, uh, yeah, we have to eat food because we have to eat the, you know, eat food to live. But at the same time, there's a difference between buying food that we need to eat versus buying wasteful junk that's just filling a void of our need to eat something like these bag of M Ms. So, um, but if you look at that, the amount of if you look at the amount of stuff that you waste, and we all, I'm guilty of it. Everyone that's watching this channel has been guilty of this. Um, there is so much that we waste that we could have used that money to gotten things that we can actually benefit from. Like for, for people that know like me being in, into my music, you know, you think about $960 if I was a smoker, wasted that on cigarettes compared to $960 is a pair of studio monitors, like, you know, or whatever, a pair of cables, a microphone. Um, so, getting back to what I was saying about this $5 bag of M&Ms. The point was that most people have $5 to buy on a pack of M&Ms, but... Let's say you only could afford 20 cents of that $5. So now I'm going to take $5. And let's say, let's break $5, right? Let's divide that by 24 months. That's at least 20 cents, right? Now, so I'm saying 20 cents a month, but I'm going, because you can't afford, simply because... You couldn't afford to finance, simply because you couldn't pay the whole $5 on that. I'm going to make a little extra on something on it. I'm going to charge you $7 because I'm going to charge you interest. So not only are you paying for that bag of M's, you're paying more than it's worth because I'm going to tack on interest. Even though this bag, this bag of M&M's are only worth $5, but I'm going to charge you 7 Now, would you pay... Let's say, Teddy, you couldn't afford $7. Would you literally pay $7 for bagging them that's only worth five? No. Yet, people do it every day when they finance stuff. Even with credit cards. Because of the interest on the credit cards. So if you bought something with a credit card, what you did is you just paid whatever that the item that you're, that you're paying on plus the interest of the credit card, add that on top of what it is that you bought. That's what you really paid for. And this happens with cars, loans, credit cards, but yet people don't think about this. So the moral of the video, the moral of the video, like I said, and I'm guilty of it, like all the other millions of Americans or whatever when it comes to debt and finance. So my philosophy is this, is really, really simple. I'll go back to this, this Allen Heath console. I don't own any, I don't owe anyone on this because I paid cash for it. And the thing is, because I'm a bargain shopper, I found this on eBay for $400. Because I was blessed and fortunate enough to get that the price of this console. I didn't have to finance it. I didn't have to take out any credit card debt, no loans to go buy this console that know that you see most of these 30, 48 channel consoles are going for three, four, five thousand dollars 
where someone might end up taking out a loan or a credit card to finance something like this, as an example. It's the same thing with, I'll use another one. You can't see it. I got two Avalon preamps, and both of them are paid for, cash. Um, same thing with, matter of fact, everything in, matter of fact, every single item in my house I paid cash for. I didn't finance anything in this house when it comes to all my, there's nothing in this house. Is, even my cars, they're all paid for. I got the title to them. Uh, me and a really good friend of mine, we we're talking about this on cars. I'll look at it like this. And a lot of people don't look at this because, you know, well, I became a mechanic because I just refused to pay other shops. I became a mechanic that way. I know the work I'm doing. I know what's being done to the cars that I'm working on because I work on my own car. So, and because I want my cars to run right, I do the job right because I don't want my cars to break down because if it does break down, I can't blame no one but myself because I'm the one that worked on it. But I became a mechanic. But I'll, I'll put it like this. One of my cars is an older Fox body. It's called a Fox body Mustang. Uh, everything I've done to that car, including all the performance parts and everything else I've done, and I've paid cash, uh, I always buy the parts. Uh, so let's look at it like this on a car. Let's say I'll use, let's say, it's 2023. 90% of the most people when it comes to cars, they want cars. They want new cars because they want a new car. It ain't that they need a new car. They just want a new car. And they, in their mind, are thinking, oh, I can, you know, because I can think in my mind, I can afford whatever the payments are going to be based on whatever the loan is, the interest of the loan. Uh, what they're going to finance versus what you got put down and whole nine spill, which I'll go into a whole different video if people want me on how that all works, your APR and your interest and everything else, right? So the car, you finance this car and most people think, but, well, I can afford $560 a month. No. You have no choice but to pay $506 a month because you can't afford the entire $60,000 or whatever it is that they want for that car. And most of them are always way over what the cars were actually worth. You know, but they call it market. They, they never go with manufacturer suggested retail price. They always go market because market means how much can we suck the money out of people to pay for this market value? People are willing to pay $60,000 for a $50,000 car. That's market value, right? That's what, so, well, most people can't afford 50,000. So if I say 50,000, yet the MS, the loan, maybe the max you can get for that 2023 on a loan would be 52,000. But the market value is going for 60,000, which means you have to come up with an additional eight thousand dollars down to cover the cost because that's the loan they're going to push to get you finance for is a sixty thousand dollar loan the most people most banks will say well i'm not finance not going to approve a sixty thousand dollar loan on the card that's only worth fifty two thousand so the max i would give you is fifty two thousand well the well the dealership say well okay we'll do fifty two thousand but i gotta get this other person to pay the other eight thousand because I want 60000 because the market says people are suckered enough to, to pay that. So $60,000, so we go 60000 and they're going to tack on all the extra stuff, pinstriping, rust coating, anything, you know, new carpet mats, uh, whatever they can throw, so in, in extra in the deal. So really, the car becomes sixty. Five sixty-three five hundred, right? Sixty-three thousand five hundred. Now, most people don't have eight thousand or whatever, or they may have a trade or whatever, and the trade may be worth eight thousand, but they're upside down. 
they still owe fifteen thousand dollars on a car that's only worth eight. Okay, fine. We'll give you eight thousand of that fifteen thousand. But now, what we'll do is we'll take off eight thousand dollars. So I'll subtract the eight thousand from the sixty-three thousand, right? These are 55500 but you still owe $7,000 on your loan. So I'm going to add that back in. So that brings the car back up to 62500 So that's usually where... So now I'm going to find that 62000 The loan, um, but, you know, for the loan will only be... 52,000 is the max they get. So now we still got to come up with another 10,000 down, even though you had a trade. But you had a trade, but you were upside down. Right? Well, let's say you don't, you, that trade was all you have. Well, 52,000, 62,000. So I'll tell you what 10,000 that you owe, you know, whatever, we'll add that in. So 62,000, I'm gonna divide that by 72 months, right? $868. Well, let's take that 62,500 and let's add the other 10,000 or whatever because the loan will only cover 52,000. So 62,000 what they're willing. So we're gonna add the 10,000 to that plus, so that becomes 72,000, right? 500, right? Divide that. 72 months won't work. So now we got to go 84 months. Now that brings the payment to, you know, from 868 to 863. So now people look, well, how much can you afford? Can you afford to pay $863 a month? And people are like, well, I make, I make $5,000 a month. My, my mortgage and my utilities and cost of living is about two thousand. That leaves me about three thousand over. So yeah, I can afford to pay an eight hundred sixty-three dollar, eight hundred sixty-three dollars a month for the next eighty-four months. Okay. So now people are thinking, yeah, I can afford to pay eight sixty-three. You know, because I traded in my other car. I only had I owe fifteen on it, even though they only gave me eight. I owe fifteen, right? So. And that, and that's pretty much how people think. Not realizing, if you look at a sixty-three times eighty-four months, seventy-two thousand five hundred dollars on a car that was only worth fifty-two thousand five hundred. So you paid twenty thousand dollars more than what the car was actually really worth. Now here's the end result of this. Fifty-two thousand five hundred in twenty twenty-three. What? Let's take a car twenty twenty-three. Let's go back five six years on that same type of model car. What is the market value of going for that same type of car that's five six years old? That's the same model. It's an older model, but it's the same type of car. Kind of like Escalade or GMC, you you know Yukon or whatever. The going rate for it is about twenty-seven thousand, right? Or whatever. Let's say twenty-seven, eight, twenty-eight thousand, whatever, twenty-two thousand five, or whatever. Depends on the mileage, the condition, blah 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 blah. So, let's say on average, the average value is only twenty-five thousand dollars, right? Twenty-five thousand dollars. Now fifty-two thousand five hundred. Divide twenty-five thousand. You know. Uh, for 25,000 for 20. So that means the car will have lose 27,500 over the next five years in value. This is what we call depreciation, right? It would depreciate 27,500. So the car is 25,000 in five years. Now let's look at the car you're paying that you financed for 84 months at 72,500 at 52,000, where at the end, that $52,000 car is only worth half of that in five years. So in five years, after you pay the $72,500 off, the car, if you want to sell it 
after you did five years, let's say you just decided you just don't want it more after five years. Okay, I'm tired of it. I have it for five years. I don't want to get rid of it. It's only worth twenty five thousand on average. So let's you know. So let's take twenty five thousand. So you wasted forty seven thousand five hundred dollars. You know, on a car that it's only worth twenty five thousand. Forty-seven thousand five hundred, and you look at the, look how close forty-seven thousand five hundred is extremely close to what the car was originally worth had you paid cash for it. And most of the time, if you look at it, forty-seven thousand five hundred, if you saved your money and bailed it out right out cash straight up, you would be amazed. Um, you would be amazed that you could negotiate. And bought something that was originally they wanted five thousand fifty two thousand five hundred and negotiated down to forty seven thousand five hundred cash, right there on the spot, no financing. I got a check for forty seven thousand five hundred. I'm going to cut right now. Now that car is paid for, and the money the eight hundred eight hundred sixty three dollars a month can go toward every anything else that you want to buy. It's kind of like stuff in my room. The reason why I can buy stuff like I got in this room is because I have no car payments. So, um, to wrap it up on debt. And I'm going to, I need to really continue to talk about debt because debt, debt uh, keeps you from buying the things you want because you have to pay, you have to pay the debt off. And people get into it because they're thinking, it's like these M&Ms. Now I'm paying $7 on M&Ms because I'm paying 23 cents a month. If I calculate 23 cents a month for the next 24 months, so I'm gonna go point 23 times 24. Or actually, it's more than that, really. But let me see. Let's see. Point twenty-eight times twenty-four. Yeah, it's about six seventy-two. So close to that's close to seven dollars. So be more. It probably would be more like seven thirty cents. So point thirty times twenty-four. Yeah, that's about right. So I'm paying thirty cents a month because I couldn't afford to pay the five dollars out. So now I'm going to pay seven dollars for it because I couldn't pay for it. That's how. America, that's how we're trapped. We're all trapped like that because we we become psychologically bound to our wants over our needs. The thing is, yes, you need a car. You don't need a brand new expensive car. You just need a more a older a more affordable less expensive car but you need an affordable car now to sum up the video let's I'll go back to this three thousand dollar car let's say you're able to buy three thousand dollar car but it's got all these problems and you think you said I just should have bought a new car and that's how people think when actuality Let's look at how much it would have cost to fix all the problems with this car. Let's say this car, the windows don't work, right? Let's say the driver's side window don't work, passenger side window don't work, or whatever. Uh, it, the ball joints are worn. The struts are worn. It needs brakes and rotors. Um, let's say the AC doesn't work. Let's say the car is smoking. The car doesn't shift right. Um, the, the, the carpet is stained, right? Uh, the headlights, you know, whatever, the wiring or whatever. There's just all kinds of issues with this car. And mo you know what most people do? They, they, a car like that, they usually junk it, sell it, or whatever, get rid of it, right? Now, uh, here, from a mechanic's point of view, this is how I look at this car with these issues. Most people, that, that $3,000 car, whatever, with all these issues, so they're just going to let it go. They'll probably end up letting it go car for $500, a thousand, because it's got all these problems. Now, me being a mechanic, I can run, I can go to Rock Auto, I can go to Vans, I can go to O'Reilly's, AutoZone, whatever, Pet Boys, doesn't matter. 
tie rod ends a shot. How much do a pair of tie rod ends cost, right? Tie rod ends usually, I don't know, 30, 40 bucks, right? Tie rod ends now is going to fix the, the issue with the steering, you know, the shaking with the steering going left and right. Because the tie rod ends, you know how, you know what it is with tie rod ends? When they take the tires off, you got a, a big old nut here going through the spindle on the, uh, right here, on the uh, end of the, what we call the rack and pinion. There's a nut there. You, un you unbolt that. You get the tie rod out of there, and there's way you get the ways to get that tie rod in off. There's another locking nut right here. You undo that. Once you get the, it out, the tie rod in out, you twist the old tie rod out, twist the new tie rod in, put the locking nut, put it back in, done, fixed. And you do that for both sides. I don't know, maybe 30, 45 minutes worth of, of labor to fix a pair of tie rods that fix my steering issue. Same thing with ball joints. Get a ball joint press and a ball joint fork to remove the ball joint. Sometimes these ball joints are pressed in the control arm. Whatever case, pair control, let's say worst case, worst case scenario, control arms with the new ball joints in it. What's the, what's the hardest part about that? There's a nut whatever case, and a lot of times there's what we call a cotter pin. Pull the cotter pin out, undo the nut, knock it down. Now that, that the ball joint comes out, there's two bolts with a, a, with a nut on each side. Now you can remove the tie rod in. It may require you to take the, the caliper bolts, the caliper brake calipers, and get the rotors out the way. Take the caliper bolts. There's usually two bolts to get the caliper bolts out. Take the brake pads out, move the caliper off. Maybe you have to use the bracket. Two bolts holding the bracket on. Take the bracket off. There's only two bolts holding on. There's only two bolts holding the caliper on. Take those two bolts out, the caliper comes out. Brakes come out. Take those other two bolts, now the brake pad that comes out. Boom, you know. And you get that out the way. And other than that, this would be the strut. That, you know, whatever the case. On the, you know, sometimes you get the lower control arm, the upper control arm. Got whatever the case may be. So I'm going to take the strut off. Two bolts holding the strut to the spindle. Take those out. Now the whole thing drops down. And you can take the spindle off because the spindle is usually sitting riding on the control arm. Right? Take the two bolts out. Now you've got the whole thing out. It may take you an hour to do both sides, but you can get them out. The control arms may be $150, $160 a piece. But they got brand new bushings and everything else. You some lubricant, some 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 grease and lubricant. You, you know, you lubricate the new bushings and so forth. Slide the new control arm in there. Got a new ball joint. You put the new spin on a new ball joint, and you reassemble everything. Now that's fixed. Now your now your car feels a lot more stable. Okay, worst case scenario. How much did that cost you? Couple of tie rod ends, 60 bucks. Two couple of control arms, a couple of hundred bucks, right? That's better than $863 of payment, right? On this $3,000 car. That fixed the front end suspension. Okay, struts, $60, $70, right? Per side. That's still less than $868 for that one payment. $860 can fix part of the entire suspension of this $3,000 car. For $868, you can put all new struts, front and back, new control arms, and tie rod ends. Now your suspension is fixed. Now the car sitting, you know, on top of that with new shocks and new springs, you know, so in your own case, now that fixed that. Here's another scenario. Another $860, which is another payment, because this person got this $868 payment going on for the next eight, seven years, right? $700, so $868, the next payment, well, that can fix your entire AC system in this $3,000 car. Compressor, average, two to $300. New condenser, all new O-rings, you know, and so forth, new Orphis tube, and Freon. On average, three to $400 for all that, right? $500 max, maybe. That gives you a new condenser, gives you a new, new compressor, some Freon, some Freon, some PAG oil for the, for the compressor. 
and that bolts on. Most of the time, you take the belt off, it's two or three bolts holding that compressor on. Other than that, there's a couple of bolts holding the, the AC, the, the pressure hoses on. Since your system doesn't work anyway, who cares the Freon leak out if there's Freon in it? If not, you're going to use gauges anyway, and uh, you can rent that stuff. Um, a vacuum pump. You can rent that from AutoZone or O'Reilly's or whatever. Um, that's, you know, so you put that on, new compressor, new AC condenser, and that's done. Now, you now after that, you recharge the system, check for leaks, you know, and all that. Now, once the system is sealed, you put Freon in it. Now you've got AC. Okay. Worst case scenario, okay. Windows, window regulators, most cars, 67 bucks per window. So it's a few clips on the panel on. That's it. Take the panel off. Window, regulator, window regulators are right there. Roll the window down, under, unbolt the bolts for the, holding the window on. Take the window out. Unbolt two or three, one, two here, one, two here. Usually about four bolts, whatever. The whole old regulator comes out. Put the new regulator in, slide the window back in, bolt the window back in. Now that window works. Let's say it's a switch. The switch is a switch. Three, you know, $67 for a switch. You pop that old switch out, unplug it, put the new switch in, plug it. Now the switch is working. Now your windows are working. You do that for all your windows. Now you got windows. Your worst case scenario, let's say you need carpet. You can get carpet, a couple hundred bucks for carpet. This is usually four bolts per chair, for, per seat. Take those four bolts out, comes out, remove the console, use a few bolts for the console. Now the carpet's ready to come out. You put new carpet in it. Now when you get new carpet, it's going to smell like a new car because it's brand new carpet. Get rid of that old stain, you know, where the, all the ketchup and mustard and all that stuff that fell on the carpet. All right? Uh, okay. Transmission failed. You know, slipping, whatever. So let's say you find another transmission anywhere from $800 to $1,600, right? Now, there's a few things holding that transmission up. You use the transmission mounts. It's bolted to the engine. So you got to unbolt the, the mounts or whatever. Unbolt the bolts holding the transmission. You got to take the starter off. Two or three bolts holding the starter on. Two or three bolts there. Take the axles out if it's front wheel drive. Or take the dry shaft for the, if it's rear wheel drive, and usually a couple of bolts on the dry shafts on for the, if it's rear axles on that. Once you do, you take the spindles off, move them out the way, whatever. Get the axles out of the the front wheel hub assemblies. Usually one big axle nut. Unscrew that big old axle nut comes off. You could tap. Now the CV axles out. Now most of the time the CV axles are either bolted in or they they're just they're just pushed in. You pop them out. Now the CV axles come out. You might lose some transmission fluid, but you can always go buy transmission fluid. Now after that, the other than that, there's a few harness enables, a few harness can you know to the sensors. Unplug those. Usually six, eight, maybe ten bolts max. Undo those. Undo the starter. Um, other than that, once you get that, the linkage for the shifter, get that out the way. It's ready to come out. Slides out. You know, and uh, if it's you know automatic, there's you know there's a torque converter, so you gotta take the plate, the, the flex plate off. There's three or four bolts for that. Rotate the motor as you undo each bolt to the flywheel, uh, flywheel to the torque converter. You just undo the bolt, then you rotate the motor, undo the next bolt, or because you need four bolts. That's it. Transmission comes out. Put the new transmission in. Reverse the procedure. It may take a day, but now you, your transmission is solid. Oh, by the way, since the engine is smoking, let's pull it. Since we're doing that, let's just join yank the motor out. You already got the transmission out, so there's only a few more things left, you know, other than the motor mounts and undoing all the harness and everything else. You, you know, all you got to do is take the accessories out, disconnect all the harness. The engine's ready to come out. Put that on the engine stand. Tear the engine down. You know, take the oil pan off. Take the cylinder heads off, the intake off. Now the engine's down to the block. Now you're ready to undo the, the main caps to the crankshaft. I'm going to go get new bearings for it. I'm going to go get new rod bearings for it. I'm going to go get new rings for it. I'm going to get new pistons for it, new gaskets and seals. I take the block over. They cylinder heads in the block to the machine shop. Let them clean it. 
put it, bring it back to the house, put it back together, put it back in. Now the engine's got zero miles on the new engine. Costs maybe twelve, thirteen hundred dollars in parts, right? And time. Now you got a solid brand new engine, solid transmission, your suspension's fixed, AC is fixed, windows are working, new carpet. Some people, some people say, well, dang, with all that, you know, that's about, you know, $4,000 or whatever, right? You pay $3,000 for the car. Let's say, well, actually, you only pay $500 for the car. You put about $4,000 in it. And let's say it does need some cosmetic light, maybe new headlight assemblies, some paint or whatever. You only pay $500 for the car. But now you got a car that's running like a brand new car. And guess what? You got no car payment. But there are there are millions of people not willing to do this. They're not willing. Not they, they would rather pay eight hundred sixty eight dollars when really in actuality, let's see. I'm gonna do the math on it because it's going on an hour. I'm that type of person. I'm a I'm a, I'm a certified mechanic, <laughs> so that doesn't bother me to do that. Let's see, $868 a month times, I'm just going to do six months. $52,808, right? $5,208. That's way less than what I got finished doing um, on everything I, it took for me to fix this car. Bought the car for $500, dropped about $45 in it. Less than six months worth of payments for a person that's paying $868 a month for the next 84 months on a $72,000 car that's only worth $52,500 and it will only be worth $25,000 by the time the loan is paid off. People don't think like that. That you can, you can go over and over in debt. Debt is kryptonite. Because debt, it's, it's so psychological when it comes to debt because people think, oh, I, because I can afford to make bare minimum payments. like, well, I can't afford seven dollars, but I can afford thirty cents. Well, I have you pay thirty cents for the next for the up for two years. You'll pay thirty cents for this bag of MMs. Yeah, I can afford thirty cents. So I'm just gonna pay you thirty cents a month for the next two years. That's how people look. When the bag of MMs is only worth five dollars. And probably ain't worth that because once the a brand new car once it's once it becomes used, when you drive a lot, it becomes a used car. It's not even worth that. You've lost 15% of its value in a day. You can't resell that same car for $52,500 more. Now it's going to the used car market. So I'm done with the video. I know it's a long video, but that's just a video on debt. And it's the same thing with credit cards and loans and everything else. You'd be amazed if, let's say, and the end video on this, let's say if a person, they made $5,000 a month and they could afford to save $400 a month. Just save it. $400, and let's say time, I'm just going to do 36 months. That's $14,400 in three years. So if you don't want to get into a five hundred dollar car and put about forty five hundred five thousand to fix it, you can always steal in three years. Let's say you found a an older car for ten grand. Now you can give take that fourteen thousand take minus ten ten thousand of it, buy the car for cash, and you still got forty four hundred dollars left over to buy you some more music gear. So. That's my perspective on debt. I know it's a, going on a pretty lengthy video, but debt is kryptonite. You got to stay out of debt and weigh your wants versus your needs. Your affordability versus you know what you can afford versus what you can't afford. And why can't you afford it? A lot of people, I don't make enough within... You can make enough if you look at what you're wasting money on versus what you're buying using your money on your knees versus what you're wasting your money on, like eating at McDonald's when you could eat at home way cheaper. Matter of fact, 
I guarantee if you bought some ground beef, some potatoes, or whatever, even if you had to drink sodas, you can buy a two liter from Walmart for like a dollar twenty and buy a two liter of soda instead of spending three dollars from McDonald's and getting a cup size like this. This is a Zaxby cup, right? Two or three dollars on that cup versus you can buy two two liters of sodas from Walmart for the same price, right? Um, so the wasteful the, the wasteful spending, um, you can, and I guarantee you, if you bought bread, ground beef, cheese, and everything, you know, all the ingredients. The homemade burger is going to taste better than the McDonald's burger. Same thing. You slop up, try to slice you, slice you up some potatoes and fry you up some potatoes, put some onions and stuff like that. How much is a bag of potatoes called? Three, four dollars for a bag of potatoes? A couple of onions, maybe, you know, dollar, maybe for a couple of onions. Now you got better tasting onions because you cook them at home. Ground beef, you know. It just you tastes better. I guarantee you that burger tastes better. Anyhow, that's it. Going to do it. That's my video on debt. We'll talk to you later.